And I am very, very pleased to introduce, first of all, our program director, um, Dr. George Billick. Uh, he is an attending surgeon on the oculoplastic and orbital, orbital surgery service at Will's Eye Clinic, Eye Hospital rather, and a professor of ophthalmology at Thomas Jefferson University. His bachelor's degree in chemistry with honors is from University of Pennsylvania, and he obtained his medical degree from Jef Jefferson Medical College. Dr. Billick completed an internship in internal medicine at Jefferson University Hospital and his residency in ophthalmology at Will's Eye Hospital. His oculoplastic and orbit orbital surgery fellowship training was completed at the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary of Harvard Medical School. And I'm here to tell you he's an awfully patient and kind man. Thank you. Whenever putting these, these conferences together, you want to have a nice spread of, of topics. And some of it for the audience may be uh, old, but uh, I think it's important to hear the basics and review that because we tend to, to forget, physicians included. And I think one of the more frustrating things that I see in, um, in blepharospasm, and I think Dr. Watson can, can confirm this uh, at the next lecture, is apraxia of eyelid opening. That's something that we really didn't pay attention to until our colleagues started pointing it out. Now you see it more and more. And it's interesting how in blepharospasm you have this spectrum of pure spasm and then a mixture of, of spasm and apraxia. And then I have a few patients that are pure apraxia. And it's, it, it's extremely frustrating for those patients because the treatment options are not well understood and limited, and it's frustrating for physicians as well. And I treat it with Botox, but I've never been able to figure out why someone who can't voluntarily open their eyelids would respond to Botox, and yet they do. And I suspect that some of it may be the local injection, but some of it may be some retroaxonal flow, which we'll talk about in just a few minutes. And it may be a more central effect. I don't know. But um, it, it, it is something that you notice more and more uh, when, when you know what to look for. Uh, and that may be, if you think about how you respond to Botox, some of your frustration may not, in fact, be the spasm part, but it may be that apraxia part, which is, is a very common combination. I think that the 7% that April mentioned is probably um, on the low end. If you really look for it, especially after you inject somebody with Botox, you'll see it more frequently, at least in, in, in uh, my practice. So we're going to move on out to, to botulinum toxins. And it, again, a lot of this you already know, but I think some of it is worth going over because as with a lot of things, when you, when you start to hear things from various sources, some of it's true and some of it is a little bit kind of made up, and hopefully uh, some of what we talk about today will clarify that. And I have no disclosures to make, and I'm only going to, I stress I'm only going to uh, uh, discuss the FDA-approved botulinum toxins available here in the U.S. We're also going to talk about the comparison of the available toxins, some of the pluses and minuses, side effects, and some of this will overlap with Dr. Watson's talk, with Dr. Murkison's talk, but as I always tell the residents, some things are worth hearing a couple of times, um, especially in medicine. So I think that's not necessarily a bad thing. So there are, in nature, seven uh, neurotoxins, botulinum neurotoxins. And the BONT just stands for botulinum neurotoxin. And um, type D does not affect humans, but the others do. And these are incredibly potent neurotoxins, the, the most potent neurotoxins known. And two of these are FDA approved for humans, uh, A and B. Um, what's interesting about Botox, and again, this is something that is developing, this understanding, is that it seems that the toxin has an, a special affinity for hyperactive nerve terminals. And this is something we do see in dystonias. Uh, whether it's the cause of the dystonia or a result of the dystonia that forms later, I don't know but it, send, it tends to work better when there's hyperactivity, as you see in dystonias, blepharospasm, hemifacial spasm, and so forth. And after the injection, and again, this is across sort of a general statement, and you all know this, it takes a couple of days to kick in. You get a maximum effect, which ha is good and bad, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, and it can last anywhere between two to five months. There is some variability between the formulations, 
but they all kind of work this way. Um, and the, the variability is, is fairly minimal among the three major uh, Botox A's. I think this is also important for the audience to understand. There are two stages of recovery for, for uh, after Botox injection. And I'll show you a picture on the next slide. The first is that after the injection, you have neuronal sprouts that form around that axon, around that nerve terminal, and they have a little bit of activity. So everybody notices that they kind of know when they start to need more Botox because the twitching's coming back a little bit, the spasm's coming back a little bit, and that's probably some of this sprouting. Well, then what happens is the main nerve terminal, the main axon, recovers from the Botox, the sprouts tend to regress, and then you need another injection. And this is important. I'm going to show you a picture before I, I um, uh, talk about why it's important to kind of not get too much Botox. But it's important to understand these two stages of sprouting and then the actual original nerve ter terminal recovery. And the problem with Botox is it's a protein. It's an extremely complex protein. This is just a couple of 3D pictures uh, from different uh, 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 views of the Botox, of the botulinum toxin molecule. But over on, on the lower right here, you see kind of a diagram. And you have these two large pieces of the molecule. You need them both to work, but they're attached to each other by a very, very, very weak disulfide bond. That's the S you see there on the lower right. And that's the part that makes Botox so fragile. And you need both of these. And again, I'll show you this in, a, in the next slide because one part of the molecule attaches to the nerve and allows the Botox molecule to get into the nerve, and the other part is actually the active part of the molecule. And if that little wimpy disulfide bond is not intact, the molecule falls apart. And that disulfide bond is very, very susceptible to environmental changes, especially temperature. And we'll talk more about that in just a second. So here's, here's how Botox works. And, uh, this is actually a picture of how Zeeman works, but this botulinum toxin, they all work pretty much the same way. So first you have your normal nerve terminal, uh, the synapse to the muscle, and you see that there's an acetylcholine molecule that's being released to stimulate that, that muscle from the nerve. That's just normal anatomy, normal physiology. This is what a hyperactive nerve terminal looks like. There's a whole lot of these little things tickling that muscle and releasing acetylcholine, and that makes that muscle just more sensitive to spasm. And whether or not this occurs in all dystonia is, is debatable, but Botox, or botulinum toxin, I should say, all the botulinum toxins have a preferential sort of efficacy against this type of, of a hyperactive nerve terminal. So what happens? Well, here you see Zeeman, but again, it's any botulinum toxin molecule. You can see the two parts of it, that larger part of the, the molecule is attaching itself onto that nerve terminal, allowing the molecule to enter the nerve. It enters the nerve where it kind of falls apart, and then the smaller part of the molecule does the work. And I want to point out that there are two ways Botox works, and, it's, and we'll talk in a couple of slides more about this, but it not only stops the release of acetylcholine right at that nerve terminal, but it also has some retrograde flow up the axon back into the central nervous system and probably has some effect there. That's why Botox works for migraines. Not because it's doing anything to this muscle, but because it's being absorbed back into the central nervous system. And that, in all likelihood, happens in dystonias as well. We just don't understand that, that mechanism of action very, very well. And then once it works, you can see there's no more acetylcholine release in the main terminal, but you have these sprouts that form. And they can start to release acetylcholine. They're not as effective as the big axon, but they can cause this little bit of stimulation that people feel when they realize, oh, the Botox is wearing off. And then once the axon recovers, those sprouts regress, and you need another injection. And then the cycle starts all over again. So what are some of the variables among the toxins? And this gets very, very complicated. I'm just going to put this up, and I'm not going to discuss everything. I just want you to show, to show the audience how difficult it is when you're dealing with chemistry and with physiology. So here's the chemistry part of it. You know, each of these toxins 
has its own composition, its own molecular weight, and because of the differences, certain changes in their chemical properties. And you know, there is a protein load, not just from the toxin, but from other things in the toxin, in the bottle. And these other things are called excipients. So there's the protein and other proteins around it, plus all the other stuff, if you will, that helps to keep that protein stable while it's being stored before it's being used. There are some you know, biologic properties that we'll touch on very briefly towards the end. Whenever you're injecting something into the human body, the immune system knows about it. That's why we have an immune system, and there can be some antigenicity. In other words, the immune system can react to the toxin. But again, we'll talk more about that a little bit later. And in case of facial dystonias, that's not really much of a problem. There's all kinds of prepar uh, preparations with pH, how you store it, and so forth. Uh, that affects the efficacy of the toxin. That's especially true after you reconstitute it. Different indications. April just told you about apraxia versus blepharospasm versus hemifacial spasm. And I can tell you that different dystonias will respond differently to Botox. We need much less Botox in somebody with hemifacial spasm, and we, for whatever reason, see a much longer duration of action than in somebody with blepharospasm. I don't know why, but just anecdotally, you see patient after patient after patient, and you realize you just don't need as much Botox in general in somebody with hemifacial spasm as opposed to blepharospasm. Geographic distribution. I mean, some places have certain Botox preparations available and others don't. And then finally, insurance coverage. I have insurance companies that refuse to pay for one preparation or the other. And that, that's what leads to sometimes having to switch between the toxins. Other considerations, well, your anatomy. That certainly plays a role, and we'll touch on this, and I think Dr. Watson's gonna talk much more about this, um, but you know, every part of this affects how you respond. And each time I or anyone else injects you, it's a little bit different. I mean, we have our patterns, we have it all documented, but each injection may be a little deeper, a little shallower, just a little bit off, and so that really changes how you do. And I'll mention age because that's also a consideration that's been shown in studies. Um, the dilution and so forth really varies. And again, we'll touch on this in the next lecture. But um, if you see, I always tell patients because sometimes patients want another opinion and so forth. And I, I always tell patients, if you see five doctors, you're going to hear about eight different injection patterns. Everybody, and it's nothing bad, good or bad about it. It's just that each physician gets comfortable with a certain pattern that works for them, and that's what they use. It doesn't mean that if you go to another doctor, they're wrong or more right than the first doctor. It's just that that's what works for them, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with trying a different uh, injection pattern. And then we briefly mentioned this. You know, there are certain direct and indirect effects. One is that if you give enough of this toxin over and over and over again, you will paralyze that muscle temporarily, and an unused muscle eventually undergoes a certain amount of atrophy. So the muscle mass may decrease, and that may not be a bad thing. It's almost like doing a chemical myectomy. But over time, that may decrease, and you may need to change the Botox dose because of that. And then finally, we talked about this, the retroaxonal transfer back into the central nervous system. And that kind of scares some, some patients sometimes when they hear about this. And I want to reassure the audience that there has never, ever, ever been one single case report of some form of bad CNS effect from facial Botox injection. I mean, this has been used probably at this point billions of doses because they use it for cosmetics as well. And there's never been a case of some bad neurologic condition occurring because of that. I think that the finding of this retroaxonal transport is actually helpful because as I mentioned, there may be a CNS, a central nervous system effect, in addition to the local effect, which in fact may be beneficial. And of course, um, with the doses that we use for facial dystonias, for, for blepharospasm, that's not high enough to cause any kind of bloodstream effect or systemic effect. That's something that we see in people with torticollis, where they need you know, four or five vials of Botox per treatment session, where there's a huge amount of Botox being injected. But for, for the facial dystonias, we just don't see that. So two simple rules. One is 
If I give you a higher dose of Botox, it'll work better, but guess what? You're at much higher risk for what we call adverse events, side effects, okay? And that's why there's always this little bit of, of a back and forth tug of war between the patient and the doctor saying, can you give me more? I don't want to give you more because it's one of these situations where if we give too much, now all the side effects go away, but they can be quite annoying for a few weeks and, and patients aren't very, very happy about it. The other thing is higher volumes will diffuse more and then you can get a better efficacy but also a higher risk of side effects of adverse events. So that's why you'll notice that we always try to mix it for different patients, different dosages and not sort of say, well, I'll just give you twice, you know, give you twice as much the volume because that's what you need. That volume, the bigger volume will spread more and may cause problems. So the rules that we have is, you know, use as little Botox as you can for it to work and use the smallest volume you can so it doesn't go all over the place where you don't want it to go. And then here are the toxins. So you have Botox, Dysport, and Xeomin, and I'm just gonna, I usually don't like to use trade names, but I'll use trade names just because it's so much easier to pronounce. And you also have Myoblock, which is a, a botulinum neurotoxin B, and I don't use that at all. I don't know if the other physicians here do, maybe they can comment on it because Myoblock has a lot of autonomic side effects. And it's actually used for things like sweating and so forth, excessive sweating or, or salivation. But we don't like to use it in dystonias because of those side effects. So I really, I, I can't recall having any patient on Myoblock. Now the other three uh, preparations we certainly use. And one of the big advantages of Xeomin, remember I told you that about that molecule that falls apart because of that, that disulfide bond. Well, the big advantage of Xeomin is it can be stored at room temperature. And that's why a lot of physicians like it because it's easy to transport between offices and so forth. But other than that, I think that these are all equivalent preparations. So in general, all these toxins, all of them are lyophilized, so they're, they're in, in powder form. They have to be reconstituted in saline. And we used to have this back and forth about, well, do you use preservative-free or preserved saline? If you use preservatives, you're injecting preservatives into the patient and so forth. There have been multiple studies that have shown that, first of all, it's very safe to use preservative, uh, uh, preserved saline. There's no decrease in efficacy and it hurts less, okay? So most physicians that, and I've been using preserved saline forever, and most physicians I know use preserved saline because of that. So just because it's preserved doesn't mean it's more dangerous or it's less effective. In fact, I think it's better because it just hurts less. When I was a fellow way back in the, in the, the Stone Age, um, we used to treat Botox bottles like it was like the, the most fragile uh, egg around. Uh, you know, you, you had to, when, you, when you, you put the saline in, you had to very gently shake it and leave it. And all, it had a sort of ritual almost with it. Turns out none of that matters. This is, you can shake the bottle, it's fine. Once you reconstitute it, as long as you store it correctly, it is good for several weeks. Uh, and the Xeomin is even good for at least a week, if not longer, at room temperature. It's actually very, very good um, if you need to use uh, the, the vial to kind of, because patients are paying out of pocket or whatever, save them money, and you can use that uh, over several, several days or even several weeks. So we've really gotten a little bit rougher with uh, handling Botox than we used to be because, quite frankly, as long as it's refrigerated, uh, uh, it can handle it. Um, so I'm going to get into what's called dose equivalence. But before I get into that, I really want to stress to the audience that all of these toxins work. They are all effective. I'm not saying at all that one is better than the other. And that's very, very important for you to remember, okay? The issue here is what if you have to switch between the toxins? Whether it's because it's not working quite well, you want to try something else, the insurance has changed, and now they say you've got to use this toxin and not that toxin. Um, or, it, you know, the, the locally, the, the, this one toxin is not available or what have you. So let's talk about two things with these toxins. One is, what does a unit mean, okay? And I'll talk about that next slide. I always thought one unit was one unit was one unit. Well, that's not really true between the toxins, okay? And then there's a subjectivity about it, you know? How, how do we say one is as effective as the other because a lot of this, when we, when we test patients is based on how do you feel? How do you think it's working? And that is somewhat subjective. So first of all, what does one unit uh, mean? You know, I was a chemistry major. 
And to me, a unit means you, you put a certain number of molecules in a certain volume, and that's a unit, and it's standard. That's not the way Botox works. Botox, is a, it's, the unit is a biologic uh, definition. It's basically how much of the Botox do you need to inject to kill off 50% of Swiss Webster mice, okay? That's what it's defined at. And so I thought to myself, what does a Swiss Webster mouse even look like? And, you know, they're pretty cute. You know, it's sort of like, wow, um, that kind of stinks. Well, don't worry. That's not how it's tested anymore, okay? This is the old way of testing. Mice are much happier now because we use something called cell-based potency, which is it's, it's done with cells but in a lab. But I still find it interesting that one unit is defined at a, a certain efficacy clinically and not how much stuff is in that volume, okay? So it's a little bit different between the, the, uh, the uh, preparations. And then how do you rate it? Well, there's what we use called the Yankovic scale, where it's kind of objective, but not really. And then there's what you use. And if any of you have been involved in any trials, you know something called the BSDI. And that stands for Blepharospasm Disability Index. And this is kind of awkward thing you have to fill out about how it's affecting your life and so forth. But those are the two scales we use. And quite frankly, they are imperfect scales. So I just want to bring all that up to you because there's a whole lot of, of variability. So let's talk about now comparisons. Well, this is easy. Botox and Xeomin is one to one. I mean, it says one to 1.2, but it's, it's, it, for all intents and purposes, it's one to one. I use one unit of Botox, I'll need one unit of Xeomin. Very, very simple. And that's been verified by numerous studies. And to me, that makes switching between these two medications extremely easy. The problem is this board, okay? And again, it's a great drug. It's as effective as any of these other toxins, but the dose equivalents can be very variable. And most people say, oh, it's about one to three to four. But if you look at studies, it can be anywhere from one to three to one to 11. So it's a pretty broad kind of spectrum. And there's some questionable evidence that maybe Dysport has more spread than the other two preparations. After you inject it, it spreads more, which again, is good and bad. It's good because it may be more effective over a wider area, but it's bad because you may get more side effects from it. And my block, which I don't use, is really off the wall because it's anywhere between one in 24 to one in 100. So to me, that's a huge, huge spectrum. But it's, at least for me, a moot point because I just don't use my block because of the other side effects. So, you know, in my practice, it's always easier to switch between Botox and Xeomin because it, I don't have to think about it. Uh, with Dysport, ugh, you know, sometimes I have to use it because of insurance, but I always warn a patient, it may take me three or four tries, uh, three or four injections before I work it out because of that, that difference in, in the dose equivalents. And what happens while you're trying to figure it out? Well, you can give too little, you can give too much, and you can have adverse events. That's just the way it is with this. And again, uh, Dr. Watson is going to talk about this, but it also matters where you inject. So we'll hear from, uh, from Dr. Merkison later about surgery, about the different layers of the orbicularis. You have three different rings. And I'm not going to belabor this point, but um, basically you can inject two ways. One is to inject into the, orb the uh, pretarsal orbicularis. And that's very, very effective, okay? But studies have shown that if you get a little bit closer to the eyelid margin, into what's called the pretarsal orbicularis, it's even more effective and may last a little bit longer. And because you're closer to the eyelid margin and away from more critical structures like the muscles that move the eye and open the lid, you may have fewer adverse events. But there's a downside to this. The downside is that that part of the muscle is really attached to deeper tissue, and Dr. Merkison will show you that in, in an anatomy slide, so it tends to hurt more. So it's this trade-off, but I think either way is okay, because the effectiveness is pretty good. I try to get closer to the lid margin, but sometimes it just, patients don't like it, because it hurts a lot, and then I have to kind of back off and go a little bit farther away. And then finally, you know, how old you are matters. And older patients um, require less Botox than younger patients. Why? Because as we age, we get a little bit of muscle atrophy. And if there's less muscle mass, you don't need as much toxin. You don't need to sort of paralyze as much muscle. So over time, you may notice that you need less and less Botox. That's not always the case, though. And again, that's nothing bad. It's just 
normal physiology. So really quickly, let's talk about adverse events. And this is kind of a busy slide from a paper. It was sort of a, re a review of all the Botox uh, preparations that we had. And you can see that it's a, it's a busy, it's a very, very busy uh, slide. I'm just going to mention two and then uh, give the rest uh, to Dr. Watson. But I think you, you've got to be careful with this. So I'm going to show you this case. Uh, this is a patient who doesn't have a dystonia. She actually has migraines. And she saw her neurologist who gave her forehead migraines. And she's in my office for, I think, a third opinion. And what happened is um, about a week or so after she got the injection for, in her forehead for the migraines, her upper lid dropped completely and she developed some double vision. So she went back to the neurologist. He thought she had something called the third nerve palsy, which can be from an aneurysm. Then she went to the ER. She got an MRA and an MRI looking for this aneurysm. They didn't find anything. They sent her home. Nobody knew what was going on. So as I said, she came to me, uh, uh, I think, a week or two later for a sec or second opinion. And I took a look at her, and we're talking, getting a history. And you can see that her brows here are down. She's got a very smooth forehead because the Botox is working. And I basically said to her, well, how quickly does this happen after the Botox? She said, oh, I don't know, three, four, or five days. And I kind of looked at her and said, well, did anyone say it's just probably the Botox? And um, she said, oh, that's interesting. And I, I basically said, why don't we just leave you alone. And we left her alone, and here she is, you know, two, three weeks later. But you have to be careful about this. I'm pointing this out to you because um, sometimes you'll wake up, and, you know, everybody gets adverse events. I get them, and I have patients that have injected 40 times, and the 41st time they get a, a, a droopy lid. That's just the way it is. But you've got to be careful not to panic about it, and also not to let your family panic about it because sometimes the Botox can go down to the lower face, gives you a facial palsy. People think you're having a stroke and it's just the Botox, okay? And it will all go away, but just be careful with that droopy lid and with that lower facial droop as well. This, on the other hand, I always warn patients about, this is called lag ophthalmos in an incomplete blink. And I would say easily half the people in the audience, if not more, experience this. You get the Botox, it kicks in maximally, and then your eyes feel gritty and dry and, you know, just they don't feel good. And that's because when it works maximally, it works on a muscle, helps you close your eye. And you can't close your eyes well. You don't blink as efficiently, and the eye dries out. And, you know, th there are ways to treat that, and we're going to hear about that. But you need to almost expect this after a routine Botox injection. And you need to use the artificial tears. And if you want more Botox, a higher dose, guess what? This is going to occur more frequently, okay? So this to me is something that you see so often that I'm not even sure I call it an adverse event. It's just, this is what happens when you inject Botox. Antigenicity, you know, all of this are very complicated proteins, not just the Botox, but other stuff around the Botox, and that can stimulate the immune system. This is really not, for me, a problem with blepharospasm. There was a lot of talk in the past about neutralizing antibodies, non-neutralizing antibodies. Um, but, you know, I, I don't think it's a real issue in facial dystonias. However, I don't like to, my, I personally don't like to inject people any more frequently than every eight weeks because the more Botox you give, the more chance of this happening. Plus, remember I told you about those sprouts that have to kind of regenerate and so forth. If you keep injecting, you don't allow the, nor the body's normal sort of function to recover from the Botox. And that Botox, that second injection, just isn't going to work as well because the body's not ready for the Botox. That nerve terminal is not ready to be blocked again. So you, you don't really want, you know, more frequent injections aren't necessarily the best thing for you, okay? Um, so in summary, I stress that all three Botox preparations I told you are extremely effective. There's not one that's more effective than the other. There's absolutely no evidence of that. The real issue is the conversion factors, and that can get a little bit tricky, especially with Dysport, but it's doable. And Dysport's a very good drug. But you have to remember that not only is a toxin a consideration, there are all of these other considerations we went over that we'll talk some more uh, in the next lecture.